Uh, good morning, everybody. Now it's time for the last key technical keynote speaker of the Big Data Congress, Tilman Rabel. Tilman is a senior researcher at the Database Systems and Information Management DIMA Group. At DIMA, he's research director and technical coordinator of the Berlin Big Data Center. Tilman received his PhD at the University of Passaut. He spent four years at the University of Toronto as a postdoc in the Middle World System Research Group. Tillman is also CEO and co-founder of the startup Bankmark, for which he acquired and exists a work. Bankmark has been awarded the IQT Innovative Award and the Wakeonomy Award, amongst others. In his talk, he will give an overview of the research, uh, recent research activity in big data system performed at the Big Data Berlin Big Data Center and the DIMA Group. And a part of this talk, he will give an overview of Apache Flink. Thank you, Tillman, for being here. The stage is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot for the introduction. Can you hear me? Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't speak any Spanish, but I'm actually, within this conference, I'm catching up some of the Spanish. Um, my talk is about big data research in Berlin, uh, especially about the Berlin Big Data Center, so what we do there, what kind of research, and uh, about P Apache Flink, uh, an open source big data analytics system or big data analytics engine. Okay, so first let me give you, whoop, let me give you an agenda of this talk. So I'll give you some background about data management, big data and data scientists, uh, especially w about why uh, we're actually doing what we're doing. So this is more about the, the reasoning uh, behind uh, the Berlin Big Data Center and about Apache Flink. And then I'll talk about the Berlin Big Data Center, what kind of research we're doing there. And then uh, the main part will be about Apache Flink, some of the technical aspects. And Apache Flink is really one of the next generation big data analytics engines or technologies. And all of this will be a technology-driven perspective. So uh, of course, and all of you know this already, and I think it also came up in the other uh, presentations. And uh, actually, David's talk just before, in, yeah, before this talk was a very nice setup for what I'm talking uh, right now about. OK, so data analysis, or data and analysis are both getting increasingly complex. Uh, you all know data is becoming too large, the volume is increasing, the data rates are becoming too fast, you cannot really keep up with traditional systems, and data is very heterogeneous, and there's lots of variability. And, but at the same time, um, what we also have is uh, we want to have more and more complex uh, analysis. And from the data uh, management perspective, you have reporting as you had before in database systems, doing aggregation selections, ad hoc queries in SQL or X query, and you do extract, transform, load, or extract, load, transform procedures today, typically with a MapReduce style engine. And, um, but you want to do more analysis. And especially if you're th talking about big data, data is really uncertain. So this is this veracity aspect. You really have to do more mining. You have to do richer analysis to get true truth out of the data. And uh, you want to do deeper analysis. You want to do real data mining and uh, predictive and prescriptive analysis. And typically, this is done in MATLAB, R, and Python. And so there's kind of a conflict here. Um, and how do we solve this? And so to make it more visual, if you talk about uh, like the two dimensions, uh, data size and uh, depth of analysis, or like, then uh, you can think about like, simple analysis on small data. You can do something like that on, with a spreadsheet or any kind of database system. If you really want to do deep analysis on, um, on small data, there's a rich uh, amount of tools, uh, very good tools that you can do a lot of nice uh, analysis, like MATLAB, R, these kind of things. And they are well established. And for simple analysis of big data, you have the Hadoop framework that we just uh, heard about. Uh, but there's no real tool uh, for deep analysis of big data. And so this is something where we really need to, to do, invest more uh, energy into. And so why do we need something beyond databases? 
And here I have four aspects why this is required, why we re need a new technology. So if you think about databases, you have tables. All of the data is stored in a structured format, uh, very neat and, and clean. Uh, but in big data system, you also have tables, you have structured data, but you also have unstructured files. And you have to read this data, and you, have to, you don't want to read it over and over. You don't want to make too much structure, but you have to read uh, the scheme or get the schema on read. And at the same time, of course, databases were always parallel. Uh, but big data systems really are much more parallel. So while a database system could have like tens of nodes, uh, a big data system can have thousands of nodes. And if you have thousands of nodes and you have large queries and you share this among many users, you really have to do a lot of resource allocation that goes beyond what, uh, what was done before, that goes beyond what is currently, for example, done in high, uh, high performance computing. And you also have to think about fault tolerance, because if you run something on a thousand nodes, something will break all the time. So you really have to continue your queries even if something breaks mid-query. And in terms of um, analysis, if you have SQL, you could do some rich analysis, but you can't do everything. If you want to do deep analysis, you need more than that. So you want SQL and Java and Scala and Python and whatever. So lots of different APIs. And you really want to do general object manipulation in your system. You want to be able to do that. And coming from, this, from the nice monolithic data warehouse aspect, uh, you go to something where you have different formats, different uh, things in your data lake. You have, you have logs, you have graphs. Of course, you also have still your data warehouse data. But you also want to do machine learning. You want to do iterative processing, which is not possible in SQL or not easily possible. And you want to do more and richer user-defined functions. And so people who can all do all that are called data scientists. And uh, this is really something where you have to uh, incorporate a lot of different, uh, uh, different knowledge. So you have to have application knowledge. You're going to have uh, domain expertise in, say, Industry 4.0, uh, medicine, physics, you name it. And uh, you want to do, know about analytics. So you're going to have skills in machine learning, statistics, and data analysis. But at the same time, and that's the thing, what we also learned in the talk before, you have to have data management capabilities. You know, have to know about scalable data management. So you have to know about memory, memory management. You have to know about parallelization and all these things. And only then you can do really rich data analysis today on big data. So data scientist has to be a jack of all trades. And um, you require systems programming. And actually, uh, there are a lot of people today who qu can do deep analysis, who can use R and MATLAB. But there's only few people who can do uh, really good Hadoop programming. And the overlap of people who can do big data analytics, this is actually very small. And this is one of the big challenges in big data. So this is uh, the big problem is little talent today. And there will be a huge shortage. And there actually already is a shortage of people that can do data related jobs. And actually, data, uh, big data analysis is right now there, uh, there where the uh, database systems were in the 70s, which means prior to relational algebra query optimization and the SQL standard. And so what we think is really required is a, a declarative languages. So something where people can forget about the, uh, the system programming aspect. And with this goal, <coughs> we started the Berlin Big Data Center. It's um, one of the two competence centers for big data in Germany, funded by the German government. Sorry about that. And uh, it draws a lot of knowledge from different uh, fields of big data research. So we have uh, machine learning people, we have applications partners, and we have systems people from different uh, universities in Berlin. And all of them working together to create like a new type of system for big data, uh, big data analysis. So the idea is really combine machine learning and data management for, for some kind of technology X, where you get all this machine learning um, uh, algorithms and everything, have, an, have them in a declarative way, but at the same time use the traditional and well-established data management technologies in order to have data analysis without system programming. So this is what we call technology X. Whoop, somehow this is 
Skipping? Okay. So, um, so what is this technology X or what is this supposed to be? It's really big data analytics without the system programming. So we call it the what, not how. You want to know what kind of data, but not how can I get this data. And if you think of it from a machine aspect, um, you really have to, if you want to write a Hadoop program today, you have to think about how do I get this data. And so, but what you want is to give the analyst some declarative, this is skipping somehow. Okay, let's keep it like this. Um, so the data analyst um, should think about uh, what, or he wants to think about what kind of data. So he wants to have a declarative aspect, declarative language. And there's, as we saw before, there's a larger human base of people who can do deep analytics uh, than people that can do the system programming. And there's even a smaller base who can do both. So in order to reduce this human latencies of uh, programming these Hadoop programs, and um, we want to build some technology that takes away all the system programming. And by this, of course, you get a huge uh, cost reduction. You get a lot more people who can actually do all this data analysis using this technology X. So, and in the in the big Berlin Big Data Center, uh, we focus on three uh, application scenarios. Um, we have application partners for uh, economics-based applications. So there, we uh, build a marketplace for information where we do a lot of text and for. Uh, text analysis uh, and streaming analysis. We have a society-based application scenario in the health science, uh, where we do integration of video images and text uh, data, large data. And we have a science-oriented application uh, track where we, do material, where we uh, work with material science people um, who have lots of numerical data that needs to be analyzed. And so what's the basis? What kind of basis do we want? And this is uh, where I'm going to talk about Apache Flink now. So Apache Flink is an open source system that originated from Berlin. Uh, it's, um, it started as the project Stratosphere funded by the German government. Due to a name conflict, it had to be renamed when it, went, uh, when it became an Apache project. It was uh, in incubation in April 2014. Since December, it's a uh, December 2014. It's a Apache top-level project, and it has a fast-growing community. And uh, I'll give you more details now. So, what is Apache Flink? It's really a general-purpose programming and database execution engine, and it draws from traditional database technology. So we take the declarativity of the languages, we take query optimization and robust out of core uh, uh, execution. And it also draws from MaxPreduce technology, where you have the scalability aspects, where you have all these rich uh, data types and complex user-defined functions. And you have this schema on read um, idea. And on top of that, we add iterations and advanced data flows and general APIs. And this gives you a very rich execution engine. So what can it be used for? It can be used for batch processing, like any of the other uh, big data analytics systems. But it also can natively su support stream processing and machine learning at scale and graph anal analyt analysis with uh, various APIs. And um, so if you think about the Hadoop ecosystem or big data ecosystem, where does it fit? You have on top, you have applications like Hive, Cascading, Giraffe. And then you have the data processing engines um, like MapReduce, Spark. Uh, and this is something that is like Flink. So MapReduce and Spark, these wooden ones can be replaced by Flink or are competitors of Flink. And below, it can work with the typical uh, Apache stack resource management, like Yarn and Mesos, and it can draw data from HDFS, HBase, or Kafka. Oops, this is, OK. Sorry about that. OK, so what, uh, why is it like a database engine, really? Or what makes it similar to a database engine and different from other big data systems? So, this really, it really uses optimization and program compilation like a database engine does. So if you have a Flink program, you will have the Flink program compiler that 
generates a data flow uh, that will be run through the Flink optimizer, where you pick uh, data shipping strategies and or local strategies and operation ordering. Uh, then you have an execution plan that will be sent to the runtime, where the runtime really picks the implementation of different operators in your in your code. So say you have a hash-based or SERP-based uh, implementation, the runtime also decides about the memory management, and then it will be sent to the parallel runtime, and the parallel runtime does all the parallelization for you. So you don't have to consider anything about the parallelization. Does the task scheduling, network data transfer, and resource allocation. And it does iterations. And so what's, what's the difference uh, in comparison to other systems? If you think about Hadoop, Hadoop iterations are really driver-based. This means uh, the loop of in an iteration is outside um, of the system, but it's all completely built into the client. So every time you do a new iteration step, say in a k-means, and you saw that on the slides of David, uh, you have like everything stops and everything has to be written to disk, and then it starts again. And this is really inefficient. And Spark does a better job at that. It has the RDDs. And so everything just goes into memory, but it's still individual jobs that are run. And Flink really is a data flow system. So what that means is you have these standing operators to topple flow through the system. This is uh, internal, uh, internally iteration aware, and it can do optimizations based on these iterations. And what's the effect of these optimizations? So why is this actually a good thing? Is you don't have to think about what the program really will be run on. You can have uh, you write your program, and it can run on a single laptop, and it will be a different execution than if you write it uh, run it on a large scale cluster, because the runtime will. Uh, decide on the execution. And even if you have like run your, your program on the same cluster multiple times, if your data changes, the, run to, uh, the execution will change. And so say, for example, if you think about transitive closure as a program, you see that, uh, so this is my example here. I'm not going to go into detail about that, but it's actually what you write, you write iteration, you write join, you write run union, uh, but what is executed is something different, actually. So this is all done by the optimizer. The Flink optimizer decides if there's pipelining, if there's sorting or hashing, and th these kind of things. So you don't have to worry about that. And uh, the system, because it's a data flow engine, it can do native streaming. And uh, this is also a very important aspect, because uh, of course, there's like a lot of uh, jobs that are batch oriented, and there's a lot of uh, streaming jobs that can be emulated with a micro batch. So, by just changing the granularity of the job, uh, of the batches, you can actually do a lot of the streaming with a batch oriented system, but not all of them. And uh, so, why is that? Actually, if you look at micro batching versus native streaming, um, so micro batches, what it does, it, it gets a few few records and then executes a job. And each of these jobs will be individual, while a native stream is you really uh, pre uh, execute every single record in a long-standing operator. And what that means is that you can do a lot different and a lot richer stream analysis. So you, your data is unbound. But uh, of course, most of the windows are around times and counts. And if this these windows are very simple or have the same sizes all the time. Actually, everything is fine. You don't have to worry about uh, micro batches. But if you need data driven windows, as soon as you want to do something like user sessioning, uh, then uh, you need richer semantics for your windows, and you cannot do uh, with you cannot do this with uh, micro batches. Okay. So with that. Um, this is what the overview of Flink. The community is uh, growing fastly, uh, and I invite all of you to join our community, test out the system. So we can see that now we're almost up to 150 um, committers, and it was one of the most active projects, active big data projects in the Apache Software Foundation in 2014. And because of that, we recently also had a nice, uh, a nice conference on the Flink De um, community and developers, and we a lot of system or a lot of companies already use Flink, like Huawei, Telefonica, and others. And uh, a lot of open source projects um, integrate Flink. Either we integrate with uh, 
them or they integrate with us. And so the, the uh, conference was attended by about 250 people with lots of companies represented. And um, yeah, please contribute. We, we would be happy if you try out the system. Um, and actually, that's it. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Timon, for uh, this very nice uh, talk like, uh, with uh, one of the most uh, active uh, research centers in, in Europe. And now this European, European board uh, initiative that is uh, growing, growing big in the big data world. Uh, we have uh, time for uh, one or two questions. If we have uh, some questions from the audience. Yes. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Can we say that it's in a stable release right now, since we see that it's receiving a lot of contribution and it's changing so far? Can we say that it's, it it's stable? Yeah, so it, it's getting more stable all the time. Um, so there are some productive use cases, and um, it's probably not as stable as, say, Hadoop. Uh, of course, there, there's been much more development around Hadoop, but uh, depending on your use case, some of the, the parts are fairly stable, yes, and can be used in a productive system. You mentioned that the companies that are using it are really big companies. They can afford spending money and time testing their, their Flink framework. But what about the small company? They, they can trust in the current state. Yes, so we have small companies that are using it. Say, for example, ResearchGate is one of the companies that are actively using it for daily um, uh, analysis, these kind of things. And depending, again, depending on what kind of analysis, there are many use cases that are stable right now. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, actually, I had a, a question. I mean, you come from Berlin. The like a really strong research center, um, very good universities. You're in contact also with this uh, collective initiative and with the startup system and big companies. One of the main issues that have been along the, 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 the Congress of the two days is, is talent, right? I mean, you were mentioning a bit. Uh, can you mention a bit like how you are addressing there? I mean, you are developing uh, state-of-the-art technology while being at the university. How, are, how is this like uh, linked and how are you doing there or which uh, actions or on the courses are you doing? So like the today's uh, new engineers come out with the right skills. Well, I mean, this is a, like a general strategy. I mean, what we do, we integrate uh, Flink development in our courses. So, uh, of course, we have courses dedicated to big data analysis and big data systems. And uh, we do project courses and, um, and tutorials and things like that to um, get people to use these systems. So I think one of the major uh, things that people need to do is really play with these systems, use the systems, get hands-on experience on, on Flink and other systems. So what we, yeah, what we do is really we give uh, people the opportunity and we require our students to, to really deal with all of these systems. I think that's the main thing that we do. But uh, uh, apart from that, we have dedicated courses and uh, we try to give tutorials at conferences we have different kinds of, uh, like even general, it's not only about Flink, it's really we had a, a nice tutorial workshop uh, this year where uh, we had different kinds of tutorials on Spark, uh, Reef, uh, Asterix DB and other systems to really just open the space and teach people uh, about big data systems. Good, very important. Okay, so thanks a lot again. Okay. Thank you very much.